Monty was not only a gifted painter, but also a calligrapher. And he invented his own script out of the local Aramaic in order to transmit his teachings more clearly. This combination of talents recalls the skills of the maker of magical scrolls, joined to the visionary powers of the similarly antinomian William Blake. But in the context of his age, Monty was a prophet, not a math man or a social outcast. Another modern outsider artist, Madge Gill, can we have her picture, please? Yeah, thank you. Discovered her gift through the intervention of her spirit guide, whom she named Merdinerist, and associated with the planet Mars. In this painting of the planet Mars, she produces a pattern of squares filled with mystical Essenic letters or symbols, very much like the magic diagrams of Armenian and Ethiopian manuscripts, and they are intended to represent both power and communication. Her written invocations include both vocas mystici, that is to say, glossolalic nonsense words, again typical of magical texts, and references to new technologies. She says, Murder in one for poems. Mernemeres Mars, Mars canals, Vedi, God, my old Jupiter, a luminary planet, through wireless mastermind, Saturn communication. I suppose if she lived in the B era, this would have been hailed as a classic, but <laughs> there are other things to say about it presently. Um, a nice English housewife named Laura Pigeon, who died in 1965, after the trauma of her divorce from her husband, took up spiritualism, astrology, and drawing, and produced some 500 mediumistic texts and pictures under the guidance of the spirit guide. These two women outsider artists display a significant feature in common that relates to the craft of the artist magician of the Christian East. They both undergo a kind of spirit possession, but instead of being prophets or shamans, they conform in the West to a type of experience validated by the society where they live, for their gender. They become mediums and spiritualists. But although the experience is spiritual, you'll note that it has a planetary and astrological object and orientation. And this deserves closer examination. In the late 19th century, the astronomer Schiaparelli professed to have seen what looked like canals on Mars. The French novelist Camille Flammarion wrote a novel about extraterrestrials, again, Mars. European writers and thinkers seem to have displaced onto the red planet, at once so alien and so close, the kind of hopes and fears that had once been expressed in the terms of a more abstract heaven or an other world peopled by angels or devils. So H.G. Wells' novel, The War of the Worlds, imagines an apocalyptic invasion by terrifying Martians, octopi the size of grizzly bears encased in invincible death ray machines, whose purpose is to punish human hubris and restore to our race a numinous awe of the universe. Nathaniel Hawthorne's son-in-law, George Lathrop, published a very similar tale on this side of the Atlantic in 1895. And then there are also good Martians, angels, as opposed to demons. For example, the, the interplanetary being from Mars in Georges Du Maurier's novel The Martian, 1896, which was a bestseller, is a gentle protective creature, an innocent vegetarian, endowed with, with synesthetic, imaginative, and extrasensory powers, bringing love and companionship to lonely Earth. Now, you'll notice how Madge Gill mentioned the wireless radio in her poem or prayer to her Martian spirit, God. The inventor of alternating current, Nikola Tesla, who firmly believed he could invent a death ray, given a little more time, believed there were intelligent beings on Mars as well, and thought he had communicated with them by wireless. He devoted a great deal of his time to the effort. The most interesting example of this cultural fixation on Mars is the case of another outsider artist, Helene Smith, a working medium, who not only communicated astrally with a Martian named Astane, 
but did so in the Martian language, which syntactically and morphologically very closely resembles her native Belgian French. It is a euphonious language, though, and the characters of the Martian alphabet that she wrote in trance, which sometimes obtruded into her waking writing, resemble somewhat the shapes of Sanskrit. This is reasonable since the deliberate exoticism of her inventions seems to be based upon what she had read of India. So you'll notice that here the great allure was of a slightly familiar but also exotic form of script, rather in the same way that Armenian magicians use Arabic letters. She uses Sanskrit ones. Her paintings of Mars, please, in case you wonder what the place looks like, and here are some, I guess this must be an olive of Mars here, or a yes. Her paintings of Mars resemble in their dense detail and syncretism of style the sculptural and architectural innovations of outsider artists such as Ferdinand Cheval, who built that in France, and the strange language, its arcane alphabet, the invocation of exoticism, seem to be an attempt by the artist to endow oneself with power, to ennoble oneself, to acquire a special glamour lacking in mundane life. The psychologist who studied Helen Smith's Martian romance writes of her homesickness for an unknown country and her instinctive inner revolt against the limitations of her station in society and her sex. In this case, the possessed visionary and outsider artist has a respectable job, but is also the subject of a psychological case study of 1899 that is still both interesting and poignant. And when we look at it in the context of the way that belief in angels and demons in heaven was displaced onto planets, onto the discoveries of more recent Western science, we can begin to see how she was her Martian uh, interlocutor, Astane, sends her a message once saying, Ane enike eredute se ilasune te ima nudetine shidure. It is here that alone I approach from heaven and gaze upon the world. This is in Martian, by the way. <laughs> Expressing both the alienation and the romantic dignity of this outsider artist, a visionary a magician who, in a world without a sacred language, without ancient Ethiopic or ancient Armenian, had to invent one for herself. So to conclude, those were the words from the way. <laughs> in this survey, one has sought first to describe the contents and styles of the Armenian magical scrolls and their sources, then to construct a hypothetical schema of the personality, experience, and training of the artist on the basis of what is known of the makers of the analogous magical scrolls of a related culture, that of Ethiopia, and finally combining salient features of magical art and the particulars of the people who make it to relate the East Christian genre to the larger genre of outsider art and outsider artists in the West with particular attention to the contrasting evaluations of religious experience and practice in the two kinds of society. In traditional Ethiopia and Armenia, the visionary who dreams, keeps company with angels, and speaks in tongues is afforded a social purpose. In the West, where heaven and hell are displaced by an unhappy and anxious materialism onto Mars, and cosmological visions, euphonious invented languages, and the like are the object of studies of neurosis. The only place for the kinsman or kinswoman of the Diratsu and Deptera is the hospital, or the prison, or even worse, the art market, in which a special niche, more in annex or garage actual, has been built.